Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this exciting latest installment of Hot Topics in Public Health. Today, we're going to be hearing about immigrant health and insider's view. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that our university is sitting on lands of the Ho-Chunk Nation. You know, even as we recognize the amazing heritage of our native populations, we should also focus on the serious challenges facing our current immigrant populations. As we speak, immigrants make up almost 9% of the population of Dane County. The most common nation of origin is Mexico. Immigration carries with it heavy burdens, including horrible health disparities. We watch with horror the images of forced migration from war-torn lands such as Afghanistan, as well as the turmoil and distress experienced by so many people at our southern border, including people from Haitia, Central America, and South America. And we have also seen all too vividly the differential effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on immigrant communities in Wisconsin and indeed throughout our country. Our School of Medicine and Public Health is committed to health equity and to becoming an anti-racist institution. Our efforts focus on our most vulnerable populations in Dane County and across all of Wisconsin. We are so delighted that Shiva Bidar Silef is going to join us, um, extending her wonderful work as UW Health's Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to now become the inaugural Associate Dean for Diversity and Equity Transformation for SMPH. So a lot of exciting things happening including this program tonight. I want to thank our two incredible panelists, Dr. Tejas Heron and Dr. Suarez. I especially want to thank John Tempty, who from the get-go has been a remarkable, innovative leader of this entire series. And special shout out to Tracy Gatos and all of the members of her team who behind the scenes make these events possible and so professional. So welcome. I know you're gonna enjoy the conversation and now it's a privilege to turn over the virtual microphone to Dr. John Tempty. Well, thank you so very much, Bob, for the introduction. Uh, welcome everybody on this beautiful autumn evening to the Hot Topics in Public Health. Over the past several months, we have invited you to hear about COVID-19 gun violence, climate change as a public health emergency. But as been, has been our tradition, the October Hot Topics is focused on the big read, this year Transcendent Kingdom by Yah Jassy, which talks about the experiences of immigrants, particularly within the realm of mental health issues. Well, by way of introduction, for Father's Day this year, my children gave me an Ancestry.com kit. And a couple weeks after that, I found myself sitting at the kitchen table spitting into a tube. Two weeks later, I received the results and went online to find them. And much as I had expected, the results were consistent with what I'd always been told about my ancestors coming from Norway. And in the mid 1880s, there was the migration of my ancestors into Juneau and Vernon County, Wisconsin. But as Dr. Golden mentioned, this is also the ancestral homeland the Ho-Chunk people. Well, immigration is really an important part of the United States. Almost all of us can trace our ancestry to immigrants. And in this diagram, we kind of see the trend over time. And at this point, we are at about 40 years of increasing immigration to this country. Uh, this graphic shows those people who consider themselves first and second generation, but most Americans consider themselves third generation or more. 
This evening, I have the incredible pleasure of introducing two phenomenal women that I've had the pleasure of working with at Winger Family Medical Center. Dr. Patricia Tez Hiron received her medical degree with honors at the National University of Mexico. And as many immigrants, she moved to the United States without anything and started over from scratch, cleaning houses to taking care of senior citizens as she went through all the steps of becoming a physician in the United States. She completed her medical training at the UW Family Medicine Residency here in Madison and joined the same program after graduation as faculty. She has been the chair of the Latino Health Council in Madison for the past 20 years. And under her leadership, several annual community initiatives have been started. For the past 17 years, she has also been the medical director of a monthly health education Spanish radio program. Patricia has received many awards. Some of the most relevant are the 2008 UW Madison Outstanding Woman of Color Award, the 2011 City County, County Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award, and the 19 or the 2016 Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism in Medicine Award. Dr. Andrea Suarez grew up in Lima, Peru and moved to the United States for the first time when she was 11 years old. She earned her undergraduate degree from Hamlin University before attending the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. And she just recently completed her family medicine residency uh, in our program. Currently, she is a clinical instructor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the SMPH. She is dedicated to the care of underserved communities and addressing health disparities. Like Dr. Tellez, she has been involved in the Latino uh, or in the Latino Health Council and has also been involved in the Latino Medical Student Association. She is committed to student-run commit, uh, clinics for uninsured patients, and she has led efforts to raise the awareness of health issues that disproportionately affect diverse communities, as well as worked to recruit underrepresented minorities in the health professions. So I'm gonna turn over the discussion to uh, Dr. Tellez and Dr. Suarez at this point in time. Thank you so much for joining us. Muchas gracias, buenas tardes, good afternoon. I am more than delighted to be sharing this presentation with Andrea. Andrea and I have been together for a while. I was her mentor through medical school and then I had the pleasure of being her mentor at uh, Wingra. So this is amazing to be able to be presenting together. So uh, let's get going with the presentation. So today we are going to talk to you about a topic that we can be talking forever and um but we're just gonna give you a little taste so that uh, you get interested on the topic and then hopefully you continue investigating more about it so uh, we want to say that we have no disclosures however we do have a disclosure to say we both love our community so all the things that, that we do for our community is because we are part of our community, uh, the Latinx community. We have been there with the struggles that our community has been. And uh, we definitely, um, you know, uh, like to do the best for our communities. So today we are going to be uh, talking to you uh, a little bit about the immigration trends and the classification of immigrants, uh, describe some challenges faced by immigrants in the U.S., and then uh, learn some basic concepts of how immigration and health um, got together. Uh, we will review a little bit uh, more about some specific aspects of immigrants' help, but um, we will talk a lot more about the challenges um, that immigrants have in the United States. 
All right. Hi, everybody. It's such an honor and a dream come true being able to give this presentation, especially uh, with Dr. Teyes Giron, who has been my mentor since I started medical school. Uh, so I will just start by describing a few of the terms that we will be using throughout this presentation. Uh, so an immigrant is somebody who has just moved from one country to another country for a variety of reasons. Uh, a refugee is somebody who has been forced out of their home country because of persecution, war, or violence. And an asylee is somebody who meets the criteria of a refugee, but it's either already in the United States seeking asylum or is at one of the a port entry, so in the border. So I'll just review a few of the um, immigration trends. Currently, about 15% of our population is considered an immigrant, and that's about 45 million people in the United States. And this includes all um, types of immigrants. Um, again, and, um, there are different categories of immigration status in the United States, and I won't give you too much detail about each of them, but. Uh, but basically, um, we have U.S. citizens and permanent residents who are in this country permanently and have the same rights uh, as somebody who has been born here. And then we have non-immigrants and undocumented, uh, an undocumented population. So non-immigrants are people who are here in the country with a temporary legal status. So it includes students and workers, and it also includes vulnerable populations such as victims of domestic violence or victims of human trafficking that have been given a temporary legal status to be in the United States. It also includes people who have qualified for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals for DACA. Uh, and we'll talk more about this in the next few slides. And um, so, and then, the undocumented population are people here who uh, don't have the legal authorization to be here. Uh, and then we talked already about refugees and asylees. Um, so the United States is a country of immigrants, and this is just some uh, additional data. Uh, so in 1960, most of the immigrants were from Europe and Canada. Uh, but in 2018, uh, most of the immigrant population, 50%, uh, was from Latin America and Mexico. Um, however, this might be a little bit surprising for some of you, but who is arriving to the United States lately? And um, currently, well, in 2018, Asians um, have been the highest uh, group of uh, immigrants who have come to the United States, and then uh, the Hispanic population um, second as well. So 31% uh, Hispanic and almost 37% Asian, uh, Asian immigrants. In terms of refugee, there is um, some more data here. Um, most refugees up to 2018 were from Burma, Iraq, and Somalia. And um, this is um, more recent data here from 2020. So there were about uh, 11,000 refugees who came to the United States. And again, uh, most of them were from the, the public, Republic of Congo, uh, Burma, and Ukraine. Um, so what is the fair action for childhood arrivals? So this is a temporary legal authorization for young adults who arrive to the United States as children. And this is, it started in 2012 and it's a two year um, work authorization and many of them are able to get licenses um, to drive. Uh, that is currently on the limbo. Uh, and I'll let Dr. Tejas talk a little bit more about this uh, and about the next slides. 
Yes, so it's, it's very important to, to emphasize this uh, category because we have so many kids that arrived to the United States and didn't even know that we're in this country without having um, the legal documentation until one day they decide to go to college and they talk to their parents and they have to disclose uh, that they um, do not qualify for certain privileges that other kids will have. And unfortunately, they have have been uh, in the limbo for, for many years uh, with the past administration. It was very scary because they basically uh, decided that they probably were going to start deporting even uh, this uh, population. And then now with the new administration, they are promising that they are going to finally try to get them to, to have a legal status. But this happens with every administration. And so far, uh, we haven't seen um, really much uh, happening. So uh, these kids now are adults that are doctors, lawyers, are working. They have been uh, contributing to this country and um, they don't know any other country. They came here when they were very little. So sending them back to a country where they don't even know could be really, really um, problematic for them. So what is happening with immigration and has been happening for many, many years, but many times this is not known to the community at large because um, I watch both news, the English news and the Spanish news. And every night that I watch the Spanish news, obviously we see something on what is happening with uh, immigration and immigrants. However, when I watch the local um, English news, we don't really hear much. And sometimes we feel that it's not a problem or it's not here or it doesn't happen in the backyard. But actually right here in Madison, Wisconsin, we still see a lot of divided families, uh, a, a lot of patients that uh, talk about the stress that it is to leave home, but not to know if they are going back. Some families that even have a strategy where they don't drive together with the with the kids because if they are stopped and they are deported at least the other one will be left behind with the kids. It is very, very difficult. And again, it's another one where uh, we have about now probably 13 to 14 million people in the United States that are undocumented that again are in the limbo. And many of these families have been living here for over 20 years and still cannot get an status because the categories that you saw before are very difficult to, to achieve. I know that sometimes I talk to people and they look at me and they say, well, why don't they just go and apply for their green card? I'm like, oh boy, you know, if you will know how difficult, even when you have a chance to apply, uh, that is sometimes it's 10 to 20 years to, to be able to, to get it. So it is very difficult. So, but the other things that we hear a lot is like, well, why are they here? They should stay home or they are coming and taking our jobs or they are not giving anything back to this country. And as you can see in this graphic, uh, the economical uh, force of immigrants in Wisconsin is enormous. Uh, many of these populations, they give a lot uh, they pay a lot on taxes and they do not qualify to get even their taxes uh, back. They are working on um, places where they are from work, uh, you know, employees, and they are providing for us for our food, for our cleaning our businesses, our hotels, and many times just in the shadows without really giving opportunity to move forward as other uh, you know, are given the opportunity in our communities. So, and then people think like, again, well, why is that they don't just stay home if this is bad, if they have to come and, and go through so much trouble? Well, the truth is that our countries are not doing well. So people are faced with the decision of, would I stay 
back home and basically risk uh, my family. We don't have food. They are recruiting them for the um, gangs and to sell drugs. Uh, they are killing our families. Other places like Haiti, they have had several earthquakes that are basically destroying uh, the country. And I think in a minimal uh, time, some people come here to get better education. But in the majority of cases, it's extreme circumstances that push people to, to migrate. And then just imagine the challenges that people go through. They basically leave everything behind. So just imagine that when you have had to move ever, you have the chance to pack your things, to pack your sentimental things and, you know, move them over. Well, many of the immigrants that come um, do not have that chance. The cost is extremely high. I just watched a program where they said that they are charging people 10 to $14,000 if they want to come in a safer way to come to the United States, but others do not have the chance to do that and they risk basically their lives walking, swimming on a boat. Uh, many families are being forced to make decisions that are very, very difficult, like sending their little ones alone or leaving them in the border. And for a lot of people, that might seem irresponsible, but actually it is an act of love because it's actually they do that and try to reunite them to some family members in the United States where they might have a better chance to survive or, you know, they stay behind and almost guarantee that, that they are not going to survive. Yeah, so um, with uh, migration, there's a lot of health risk that, uh, that uh, happen. So... First of all, people before coming to a new country, um, a lot of them have experienced a lot of violence, a lot of um, forced displacement, uh, a lot of disruption in their lives. They haven't had access to healthcare or um, basic resources such as running water or electricity. And as Dr. Tejas Hiron was saying, once they are in transit towards moving to a different country, um, they also are exposed to uh, communicable diseases. They, uh, they're not able, most of them, to follow up on their chronic health conditions. Many of them don't have their medications. And again, uh, they don't have enough resources available for them. And once... Um, once an immigrant, uh, an immigrant gets to the United States, in this case, uh, many of the immigrants, uh, like we said, have to work very dangerous uh, works and dangerous working conditions. Um, it is not easy to resettle. There's a lot of trauma, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, mental health issues, and also establishing uh, with a new healthcare provider, it's, it's hard and appropriate access to um, education and um, overall um, just resettling here can be very, very uh, stressful for immigrant communities. So yes, uh, as, as, as you will expect, then these communities already come from an empowered place. And when they get here, it's not like they get here and they start making a lot of money. So we see in immigrant populations in general, a higher poverty rate. Uh, most likely they are gonna be uninsured because they are working at jobs that do not provide good benefits. They do not know the healthcare system in the United States and it can be very complex. Even for us, it is very, very complex. And a lot of the people that travel here under the conditions that we're talking to you about, they don't even have a very good education back home in general, but even less for health education. Um, they, once they made it here, they have to work on any type of jobs that they can find. And they face a lot of abuse and discrimination because they are always in fear of deportation, right? So, and then it is, um, as you heard before, there are even among the immigrants different status. So it's different if you come here as a refugee, you get certain 
certain benefits and certain protection. Uh, but if you are here as an undocumented immigrant, uh, that could be a really big problem. And as you saw it in the graphics before, it was very interesting on the things we have done with the community that um, about a couple of years ago, there was a threat because immigration was here in town. And it was very interesting to see that the Latinx community was not the only one that was uh, being targeted. There was a lot of people from the um, Southeast Asian community and African communities that also have a large uh, group of undocumented immigrants in town that were very scared about what was happening. So uh, just reminding you that, um, you know, we cannot take for granted that immigrants just uh, are Latinx, but that we have other populations in town that are also in this category. So one common question uh, that a lot of us have is whether refugees and immigrants are required to have a, a medical examination and be up to date in their immunizations before, uh, before arriving to the United States. And uh, the reality is that all refugees, yes, they are required to have a uh, a medical exam before coming to the United States, and there is screen for certain uh, communicable diseases. Um, however, most immigrants not necessarily have had access to health care in the first place, much less uh, a recent medical examination. Uh, so just a quick overview. Um, refugees do get um, do get a medical exam before coming to the United States, and there are certain guidelines for malaria and intestinal parasites that uh, they're screened and treated for, and they're also screened for other infectious diseases. And then once they get here to the United States, then they uh, they are able to get another uh, medical exam within 30 to 90 days. Um, so, but like I said, uh, this is only for refugees, most immigrants, especially immigrants coming from vulnerable places have not have uh, the right medical care in their home countries. Um, so when caring for newly arrived refugees and immigrants, what are some important aspects uh, of their medical family and social history that we should attempt to uh, to obtain during our first visits. So I would say that the first um, priority should be to focus on their immediate health concerns and also establishing a trusting relationship. Like I was telling you, a lot of people um, who have uh, come to the United States, they have had a lack of uh, health care access and um, so I would focus on their immediate health concerns and also establish a trusting relationship so that we can continue to provide care for them. And I understand how challenging it must be because most of the time um, we were not going to have past medical records or we're not really going to have all the records available. Uh, but I would say, um, especially focusing on preventive screening and counseling uh, and establishing a trusting relationship would be the key of um, the first visit. And also, if we have time immunizations and making sure that they're up to date in their TB screening. Um, this is just a quick slide of the recommended labs for refugees, uh, and this is from the CDC web page. And so basically it's just basic labs and making sure immunizations are up to date and we can screen for uh, parasites and tuberculosis as well. Um, so how important would a mental health screen be? So I would say very, very important because a lot of the, like we were saying, a lot of the uh, refugee community and immigrant community, especially uh, people who uh, who come here without a legal authorization, have been exposed to really harsh condition, including violence, and they are separated. They from their families, from their uh, support groups, and so and then they have to adapt to a new culture. So. Um, there is a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and also uh, we should be screening for substance use disorders and other uh, mental health conditions. Uh, 
during the first few visits of uh, uh, once a patient establishes in our clinics. Uh, like I was talking about, and I'll let Dr. Tejas talk a little bit more about this, um, there are unique stressors for uh, immigrant community, including previous trauma prior to migration, and also um, a lot of the children who um, have experienced a lot of violence and poverty, and also um, are separated from their families. Yeah, so this is uh, one that is um, extremely important to keep in mind uh, because sometimes we tend to assume certain things about the patients that we serve. And obviously they come here and at first they don't have a trust of the system because if you could imagine what they have been going through and uh, the, the um, safe nets that they have had, uh, when they come, if they don't trust you and you ask questions that are or seem threatening, it's going to be harder for them to really share with you. But uh, we are seeing more and more people uh, uh, in the past year or so, a very large influx from people from Venezuela, that when you talk to them, they are coming from a system that was already traumatic to them. And then now they are coming to a, another country where they are having to learn things very quickly. We are seeing women that are coming um, and getting here uh, pregnant and, and having kids that did not have any prenatal care and, and that uh, we are having to serve. Uh, we are hearing now that there is an increased risk for um, you know, infant mortality in the Latinx population. And we just had a conversation, Shiva Vidar Silaf and myself uh, with a reporter about it. And there are so many complex factors that uh, play into all of this. So you are listening to all of the things today that immigrants have to go through. And then if you don't have any previous medical care and you are arriving here just as, you know, having a baby, you don't know the system. Uh, the system here assumes that you are going to know everything about the system. And if that you don't know, maybe you are not capable of taking care of your own uh, baby, for example. Uh, we have a case like that right now. And, and many times it's not the case, obviously, uh, when you talk to a cultural broker and, and you understand the situation and the conditions that patients are coming under, then that makes uh, a big, big difference. Uh, there was a case I clearly remembered uh, Dr. Fry uh, wrote about this. Uh, we were seeing this uh, kid in the clinic, a seven-year-old for a well child, and he always loved to talk about the uh, the histories of the family. So when he started talking to the kid, um, he knew the family. He knew actually the mother and the father. And and he said, so when, uh, how are you being? I haven't met you before. How come? I know your parents. And she said, well, I just got here. And he said, no, how come you just got here if your parents have been here? And the seven-year-old disclosed that she came all the way from Mexico with just somebody that she didn't even know that they hired to be able to bring her here. And here she was, right? And uh, and for other people, those stories are foreign stories. Like, oh my goodness, how is that a seven-year-old? And how is that the parents did this? For Andrea and for myself, those are stories that we hear every single day with the families that we serve and with the work that we do in the community. So, um, you know, currently you see what is happening at the border and, and how complex is the problem with uh, immigration. So, uh, you know, we're giving you just a little taste of it today, but hoping to inspire you to learn more about it. So, but we had talked a lot about, um, you know, what they come and they pass through and what the needs are and 
the disparities that they live. But I, I really love to talk about this last um, slide because uh, sometimes we go into communities thinking that we're going to go and save them, that they don't have resources on their own. And after this presentation, if you haven't gotten the resilience that immigrants have, you know, I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, our patients teach us every day what resilience is. When I talk to them and I hear their stories, I think about my personal life and I go, Patricia, don't complain. You know, you had certain privilege of coming here. You started over, but you were in a different position. Uh, and, and when we hear about other um, that come as, uh, you know, uh, refugees and the things that they had to go through their country now that we have our brothers and sisters from Afghanistan here. We're going to start hearing stories that we cannot even believe that someone will go through and survive and be happy and be thriving. And, and that's what we see over and over with our uh, immigrant communities. Uh, and then we think about, well, how is that this could be? Well, we learned that for families that get to the United States and keep their traditional health habits, their health is better. That when we start acculturating uh, to this country and eating more processed meals and not exercising as much as we did back home is when our health situation starts changing. We also have a very strong family and social network that actually is protective. So, um, you know, we have mom, grandma, and that is helping us take care of the kids, that is helping us at home. Like, I don't know what I will do without my mother. I get home and my dinner is ready to go. I love her. Uh, my little one never had to go to daycare uh, because of not having someone to take care of him. So, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing what, what having the, the social uh, networks and the strong family support. Uh, immigrants for the most and refugees are, you know, willing to adapt to any employment opportunity because when you come from countries where you don't have anything, uh, you know, this is, this is really, really important. And then the grassroots community organization Organizations. I really want to tell you quickly that um, here in Den County, um, we are really privileged to have grassroots community organizations that have helped us address a lot of the issues, particularly for the Latinx community. I'm so proud of, of the organization that we have been able to create here to, to be able to uh, provide for our own. So there are a lot of things that we have, but there are still a lot of needs uh, that our communities have. We have a list of extra resources uh, for you uh, in case you need more. And um, we are going to now uh, go to the questions because we know that there have been a lot of questions um, about this topic. So thank you for coming today. It is a pleasure to be talking to you about this. Thank you, Andrea, for being my co-presenter today. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you so much to both Dr. Tellez Huron and Dr. Suarez. I, I thought I would start out the conversation with just one question, particularly for Dr. Tellez. Uh, you have been with Winger Clinic for a long time, and I've known you for a long time. But one of the, you know, the questions that came in earlier uh, dealt with providing health care when there is a background of language or communication barriers. And I believe when you first came to Winger Clinic, there was not much there in terms of Spanish language provision of care. And could you reflect on your experience over the past 24 years and how you've seen that change in terms of the care provided to your community? 
So we're gonna have to disclose that this is unique again for Dane County. When I go to my national conferences and I talk to people from even LA, um, Chicago, Florida, and they hear what the infrastructure that we have been able to create here in Dane County, they cannot believe it. So yes, I started at Wingra 24 years ago. And I remember clearly that we had um, a couple of providers at Wingra, Dr. Anstead, my dear Dr. Anstead and, and Dr. Fry, and they already had some uh, Spanish speaking patients that will come to Wingra. But at that time, we did not have any receptionists. We did not have interpreters that were qualified to interpret. So I remember going around the clinic, following my patients and translating for them for x-rays and labs and obviously it was very very difficult for me to provide this care so at that moment is when i say situations um, have to change we need to create an infrastructure and it wasn't just me actually uh, it was a group of people as i was saying before that I started organizing in the community and say how can we provide for our community right so we started creating the infrastructure we had a group that is uh, the latin Latino Support Network, and from there, the Latino Health Council. And my dear Shiva Vidarsilav, my co-chair, my, uh, you know, he is my partner in crime. And, and it's like, if we could be just one, we'll, we'll be perfect because I, I, I do the medical side, but she does the, um, you know, community side and, and founds and all that, so it's amazing. I, I'm just, blessed to have someone with her with me like that so then from there we started setting this infrastructure that then grew into having interpreting services available at every healthcare system here in town so now we have qualified interpreters that are at every level every uh, urgent care every clinic either in person or on the phone or on an ipad or providers that can speak you know, uh, doctors that can speak the language. So now at Access Community Health Center all around, I think we probably are the ones that have the most bilingual providers probably nationwide because we have too many. And then from there, we now have receptionists that speak Spanish and MAs and the system again that, that has been able to create that. Uh, culturally, we still need more providers that are from our communities, and I'm not talking only from the Latinx community, but I would love to have more uh, Hmong, uh, Nepali, uh, that will be amazing for patients to be able to communicate on their own language with their uh, you know, healthcare uh, personnel, and that will be amazing. But I definitely have seen a, a big, a big change uh, from when I started at Wingra uh, 24 years ago. And as a follow-up to that, just asking about uh, your impression of the need to get clinicians, uh, medical assistants, laboratorians, and so on, that are representative of broader cultures and broader backgrounds. Yes, so uh, as we had to start somewhere at Wingra, right, uh, 24 years ago, uh, we need to uh, start by growing our own. So the pipeline, right? So um, in the community, we have been doing a lot of mentorship, including our beautiful Andrea Suarez, and we're trying to grow our own, but from the bottom. Right, so we include the students from high school up and mentor them not only on how the system works in the United States, but the support, which is even sometimes more important. Like, you are valuable, we need you, you can do this, don't give up. You know, we need to continue, and that goes for everyone from MAs to nursing to uh, physicians, physician assistants to everyone. So, the system needs to start creating those pipelines, programs, and, and giving the resources that these communities need. Have yes, a and I would, I would also say that by having a diverse uh, population in your clinic, you also uh, make patients feel more comfortable and to establish that uh, trusting relationship as well. 
I have a, a question here from uh, Kristen Coleman, and uh, she is asking, uh, what are some of the things that future healthcare providers can do to better care for immigrant communities? And what are some of the ways to get involved? Andrea? Um, so I think the first thing is just being uh, open to learn and being humble that there is a lot of information. And really, uh, we're learning every day. Like I've been uh, at Wingra uh, and working with immigrant communities for so many years and every day I learn something new so I think being humble and saying I don't know let me look the information uh, and just uh, being open to to learning that would be my first uh, my first advice and something that I am always asking in the in the conversations that I have with people is but I am not Latina or Latino or I am not Hmong uh, so how could I even belong to the population what can I do so that I am accepted and I always tell them let's be real there are not enough of us to provide for our communities we have to have other people other you know providers help us because otherwise we will never be able to provide at this point hopefully eventually we will but when you come into the conversation with an open minded and an open heart when you come and you even say hello right hola try there you open the door people say okay this is someone that cares, cares enough to at least communicate with me on, on saying hola, right? And from there, the conversation just starts and the trust starts building. From uh, Kelly Bauman, how do immigrants find you or other doctors or other clinicians? And what do you do to find them? I am thinking, going, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Andrea. Go ahead, Andrea. Uh, so I had a lot of patients said that they usually will look up on like on internet, kind of what a clinic is and see and choose their primary care based on uh, not only race or, or language, but on interest, right? Like sometimes we can put what we're uh, passionate about and what uh, we work outside of medicine. And so I had some patients who uh, specifically wanted somebody who spoke Spanish, so, so looked online. And then a lot of it is also word from word. I, th I think if you uh, know one patient, you connect with them, sometimes they tell, you know, their family member, their friend, and um, and so on, so on. So uh, that's my experience so far. Well, my experience after 24 years is that people talk to other people. So I can tell you that the reputation, and this could be good and it could be bad. So I can tell you that with Access Community Health Centers, WINGRA, we have been able to establish a reputation, a reputation where we welcome anyone and everyone. And then from there, again, it could be good or could be bad because we have seen some cases in, in the past where if there is a bad outcome that happens to a member of one community, that goes out quickly in the community and the other members of the community do not want to go to that facility and repairing the damage really takes years for, for that community, right? So there goes how it is an honor to serve these communities, but it's also a responsibility, a big responsibility to really show them that we care for them. But usually that's how it happens, you know, from doing in the community, from living with them. So I live with them. I go to the markers that they go. I go to church with them. So they get to know who I am. They listen to the radio and they want to come and see us because they trust, you know, the things we are doing for them. And kind of, again, a follow-up to this. Uh, from your experience now, uh, spending 24 years uh, at uh, the School of Medicine, Public Health, and UW Health, are you able to comment on your experience and then also you, Dr. Suarez, as being somebody who went through medical school or uh, and residency, and what uh, has been your impression of the institutional response to the needs of a diverse community? I am going to say 24 years at Winga, right? 
uh, for people that know me, I wouldn't have last there uh, this long if I wouldn't feel that I am among family. You know, I know that some of our MAs might be seeing this. I love you guys. Really, I love working with you. But I love uh, Wingra and Access in general because of what I say before, because we mean what we say. We really care for the populations that we serve, sometimes to the extremes. Uh, since I joined um, the faculty and even before as a resident, the support that I have had from my uh, partners at, at Wingrad, Dr. Tempty has been amazing, and Kirsten and everyone there, they make me feel so welcome every day when I get there. And then when I see that, again, we mean what we say, and we have MAs and receptionists that are very diverse, then is when I see that that we are really doing what we need to be doing. So I think at the systemic uh, um, level, uh, the fact that we just appointed Shiva Bidarsi Laf to continue guiding us into, you know, the, the diversity is, is just a proof that we realize the work that she has been doing for so many years and that she can lead us into getting ahead, uh, you know, with um, dismantling racism here. So Andrea? Yeah, yeah, so I um, I did medical school here and I saw a lot of the support that was given to patients. And that was one of the reasons I decided to stay in uh, with the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I, I've always wanted to work with underserved communities and um, the support and resources that we have for patients here who are very vulnerable is just amazing. And so I've been so grateful that I've been able to give the best care that I can towards my patients. And cost has never been an issue in terms of the programs that are that are available for people who don't have the resources or don't have health insurance. It's never limited um, how much I can do. So that's been so gratifying for me. And also the, the support that I've received as a minority member uh, and from all the staff and like Dr. Tejas Giron has been my mentor since day one. So that was a great, uh, uh, you know, seeing all the programs available for for uh, members of uh, minority communities has, has been great and has been very um, rewarding to, to be able to continue caring for, for this community. So from a public health standpoint, we have a question from uh, Dr. Pat Remington, our former uh, Associate Dean of Public Health here. Um, and the question is, can you comment on the role for our local public health department, so Public Health Madison and Dane County, and other community organizations in your work and specifically in helping to provide care for the immigrant community? Pat, I love the helmet in the picture. And, and that is also telling people, wear your helmet, right? So <laughs> even on that, he's giving a message. Thank you for the question. Um, in order for um, the community at large and for our communities to receive the care that they need, we cannot do it alone. We need to establish um, collaborations. And definitely public health department and other organizations are crucial to be able to provide for everyone. When you see again the unique system that we have here in Den County, I'm gonna give you another example where any kid receives care uh, one way or another. This is particularly for immigrant kids, particularly for kids that are undocumented that do not qualify for medical assistance. So every healthcare system in town, they got all together and say, how can we provide for these kids that are really in great need and in great danger? And they decided to create the, the PAC program where uh, you know kids are adopted to different clinics. So access, we adopt some clinics from the school district here in Madison and we provide full care for them, including medications. That is unique. What else can we do that? And that was only, um, you know, due to the collaboration of all the healthcare systems, realizing the needs of the community and saying, how can we address these issues? Right now with COVID, obviously we have had to have a very close collaboration 
with uh, the public health department because we need the resources that they could provide. So we had the insider's view, we had the trust of our communities, but without having the resources that public health could offer, we will have never been able uh, to do this. And without, again, the collaboration of all the grassroots organizations, we will not be able to do what we have been doing. And I want to tell you that vaccination rate among Latinx 18 and over is better than even for the white community. So we must be doing something good that, that it seems to be working. Andrea? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think um, a lot of the work that I've seen in the community, um, getting that trust from the community, uh, especially uh, the Latinx community that I've seen all the work uh, um, from uh, the Latino Health Council and from many other organizations have been great and paramount in this um, enormous efforts to get people vaccinated now with COVID, against COVID-19. We have a question from Katrina Gonzalez that we won't put up on the screen, but she's asking whether or not uh, some of the uh, questions that were previously previously submitted are going to be addressed. And I'm going to uh, correct that uh, uh, lack of asking right now and combine a couple of them together. Uh, one, you know, is how can those of us interested in immigrant health get involved? And how can we as individuals become better advocates for are immigrants facing health disparities in our community? Great question, right? So I can answer it in a very, very big way. And uh, the word is vote, V-O-T-E, right? If you have the right to vote, and you know who of our leaders will be better and more friendly to immigrants, please, please go out and vote. That was amazing on this last election because for the past administration, our communities were really in fear and in pain. Um, we are trying to adjust now to other changes that are happening, but definitely your vote counts. And there are many organizations in town that are working with immigrants uh, that are always welcoming help uh, from other people in the community. Um, be nice to each other, right? So be nice to people when you see them out. Don't, don't ask questions that uh, might not be the questions that we want to be asked right? Have an open mind and an open heart, as, as we say before. So I'm going to change directions a little bit here. And uh, this is from uh, Kevin, I believe, serve in the font is very small here. So if I get your, or uh, uh, Karina, <clears throat> And the question deals with what are the specific ways that you have seen the pandemic amplify or address disparities in the medical system? And there was another pre previously submitted question is how has COVID-19 impacted the care or connection of providers to immigrants? Oh boy, how do we answer this in a brief? Um, health disparities were obviously there before COVID. COVID just brought this to light like magnifier, like in a big screen, like when you go to the movie theater and you go to these IMAX screens. Uh, when, when we realized that the communities of color were disproportionately affected and particularly for Latinx. Um, and, and, and now, you know, the elephant in the room is out. Right, it's like we have been talking about this before COVID. Now we cannot hide it anymore. We need to start providing for these communities even before, right? We have an emergency. But even through the emergency, we did not see that uh, a lot of the systems came through to really provide um, 
the needs that these communities uh, have. And again, trusting the community and going in the community and asking what resources you have, because uh, we will have time, we will tell you about all the things that we have been doing here in the county to be able to provide for um, our community through COVID. It has been a long ride and it's still, now we're going with the vaccines, but in the beginning it was how to provide financial assistance to people that was the main needs that they had. And then from there really health was a, a little bit lower because they needed to first provide to, to their families. Andrea, do you have anything extra? Uh, no, I would just say how um, affected were especially vulnerable populations with the pandemic. Many of them lost their jobs, lost their insurances, uh, and like you said, had to provide uh, more financial support to their families. So maybe their health was a lower priority. So um, I think just being... Um, just seeing all, all the resources available was, we just had to expand it and making sure that we were uh, targeting vulnerable populations and making sure that they knew of the resources available. I think that was the first thing. I think in Madison, there were a lot of resources available, but just patients were not aware. Um, so putting it out there in the community uh, was very important as well. And again, being very, um Direct, right? Because uh, I, I want to say that uh, when we knew that we had the vaccine, we were very afraid in the community that we were going to be last in the line as we have been with many other things. And it was such a privilege to have people that really were looking after us that decided and say, no, these communities are being affected disproportionately. They need the vaccine first. And thank you for uh, the university, you know, hospital and clinics, Shiva, for putting us at the front of the line and saying, we are gonna have days specifically to provide for this population that have been affected. Without that, I don't think that we will be where we are right now with vaccines uh, because people wanted to get the vaccine, but, you know, couldn't have access if we wouldn't have created those systems. So both of you are incredibly positive individuals. I, I know this from uh, long experience, but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to comment on a personal level some of the challenges that you have faced as uh, both immigrants and as members of, you know, the BIPOC community, you know, people who have been out of the majority and uh, also with a long experience of, of dealing with uh, your communities. Andrea. Yeah, um, so definitely it's been challenging and I wouldn't be here without the, the support of so many people um, who, you know, helped me throughout throughout my way here. Uh, but yeah, definitely um, uh, there is racism. There is still, you know, times where I'm the only person of color in a, in a whole room. And, and so that takes a toll. And um, also you get to see your community suffering more, being more affected than, than other communities. And so that, that uh, causes a lot of stress, a lot of stress. And um, obviously, um, you know, you see all the impact on a more personal basis because you see it happening to your community. Um, so so that, that's that been hard. I think um, the, the silver lining is just seeing how supportive everybody has been uh, around me and uh, the passion we have for helping our community. Yes, and it's still very distressing that a lot of this uh, discrimination many times is not coming um, from outside. It can be coming from peers at the hospital, uh, from other uh, members of the uh, health team uh, that uh, makes uh, remarks that are inappropriate, uh, that they don't trust you, that you still have to be proving to them that even if you are dark and short, you are very intelligent and you can provide for them, you know, to go in a patient room and they are checking you. And I had experience when a patient told me, what is your authenticity? 
And I had to interpret that like, are you talking about my ethnicity? Because I'm very authentic as my husband. I'm very, very authentic. Uh, so, and to have to suffer against two patients calling you names, I was named the Egyptian queen, now oh, there is this, the Egyptian queen coming, and having to balance that with providing excellent care to, to these patients that are, um, you know, telling you things that directly affect you, right? Uh, but again, it's, uh, as an immigrant, once you find your place in this country, once you uh, find um your uh, reason, uh, then that keeps you going. For me, my patients, my collaborators, uh, my family, I don't know what I will do without uh, having a family that is extremely open-minded and supportive. Um, I don't know what I will do. And obviously having very, very good clinic partners. And you touched upon it just in your answer right now, but one of the questions that came in earlier is how is immigrant health affected by generational families in the United States? Do we see differences in health between generations? Yes, um, we see a very important phenomena because um, hierarchically in our countries, our elderly are the ones that many times make decisions um, they are wise, so they educate us with their uh, norms. And when we come to the United States and you see different families where kids are being born and raised here, and then they call grandma or grandpa to come and help with the kids, but the kids sometimes do not even speak the language anymore. So they don't communicate with grandma or grandpa. By the way, grandma and grandpa do not qualify for MA or Medicare, so they need to find other means means to fund their medical care and obviously they come and they are sick they have diabetes hypertension and they they need to have uh, this covered and then you have kids that are uh, citizens of the United States with parents that are still undocumented and do not qualify in this case with COVID even for the financial stimuli uh, how do you provide for these kids that are already citizen in the United States and then our kids are really suffering they are growing between two cultures a culture that tends to be more permissive and a culture that seems to be overprotective, let's face it. And how do you find that balance on raising these kids and helping them with their uh, mental health needs and understanding the needs? So uh, the other thing is Latinx, we are very diverse. So we are clumped into Latinx but we are very different depending where we are coming from. And for example, Puerto Ricans, uh, we still have this question of, so are there undocumented Puerto Ricans? It's like, excuse me, Puerto Rico has had citizenship for a long time. Oh, really? Yes. So depending where you are coming from and what your previous experience is, is going to be what your health is going to look like too. Andrea? Yeah, I, I don't really have much to add. I would say it's uh, it's hard, right, to to grow, in, for the children to grow in, they, they are Americans, the children who are here, and then they have different uh, upbringing and, and background than their parents and their grandparents. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's just very, very, um, very interesting how, um, uh, how it affects everything, not only their health, but their uh, their sense of community and their sense of, of belonging as well. And another question in from Lore uh, asking, how does coordinated care play out in the immigrant community, especially those uh, undocumented? How do you try or how do you try to ensure a smooth transition from one site to another, from one service to another. You want to start, Andrea? Sure, and I can only tell you about what my experience have been in ATSIS and with the resources we have. Um, so for people who um, don't have insurance or are undocumented and don't qualify for um, 
health insurance, they, there's a program that is based on income and they get a discount based on however much they make. And then once they're in clinic, usually we can order all the labs and everything and it's one one cost. Uh, if we do need to refer them to a specialist or do further imaging, um, there's a discount through the University of Wisconsin, which uh, if they qualify for the discount in our clinic, usually they qualify for the discount uh, at the hospitals. And um, usually, you know, I'm able to put the referrals and I don't ever see a delay because a patient has the discount or not. I've never seen that. I think uh, once we put a referral, a patient is treated like everybody else. Uh, and usually, again, uh, if they, they have a need, even if they don't have the money to pay, there will be a program, there'll be a, a way to, to afford, uh, to make it affordable for that family and, page, uh, and patient. Yeah, and particularly as I was talking before, the elderly, right? If they don't qualify for um, the same benefits that others do, um, uh, with Access Community Health Center, with the collaboration with UW Health, uh, if they qualify, which, you know, all they need to do is say, I live with my family, I don't have any income, they signed a letter that easy, and we are providing care for them for $15 regardless of what they need, lab, x-rays. Um, we have a discounted program for medications. We have other programs in the community like the Well Women program that can provide assistance for mammogram and for cervical cancer screening. So when you work with this population, with the immigrant population, you have to have a special services for them. So we have a wonderful social worker, Abigail, if you're listening, um, Mary Vasquez that was there before for uh, our social worker and now basically runs our clinic very smoothly. And then all the connections that you establish in the community are gonna be really crucial to be able to provide for, um, for the community. So if you work with this population and you don't know what is happening in their community, it becomes harder to be able to provide uh, what they need. And another uh, question in from uh, Shannon uh, Drake Boer. Uh, and it deals with uh, the social safety net uh, that exists out here. Uh, so do you think the, the safety net is robust enough, uh, especially for healthcare services for those not eligible for Medicaid uh, because of their immigration status? I'm gonna say it depends what we're talking about. So for basic services, um, that is still a struggle, right? Because the system cannot provide for everyone. So that we still have a lot of uninsured, uninsurable, and people that do not have a home, a clinical home, yes, we still have a lot of people that will need more resources. Therefore, we need more funding for qualified federal centers, right? So access needs to continue having the funding from the community at large, and the community at large needs to continue advocating with the higher levels that we continue funding programs that are important. The problem is, again, sometimes, uh, the politicians, the media makes you believe that immigrants are here just taking resources away from the population, which is not true at all. And then with that thought in mind, a lot of people in the community at large votes again providing services to immigrants. And now with COVID, we are seeing it. We are not on this alone. If you don't provide care for everyone in the community, it's going to reflect in your community, right? If we don't provide testing for COVID, if we don't provide vaccines for immigrants, they are going to continue going out and infecting others. So we are on this together, regardless of what you think about why immigrants are here or if they should be here or if they should be legalized or not. If you want to be selfish and think about your benefit of providing care, there it is. You know, so but in general, I'm going to say that we have been able to provide some safety nets for a lot of people that wouldn't have benefit of, um, you know, having the care and the services that we have been able to create here in Dane County, which is not the same in other places in, in Wisconsin. And I just have another quick question, uh, kind of in follow up. And in my experience, 
so often you find the new immigrants taking the jobs that nobody else wants. Uh, years ago, I remember taking care of a patient at St. Mary's who uh, in his mid fifties was working as a roofer, uh, ended up uh, damaging a leg uh, in a fall and getting hit by an 80 pound roll of, or piece of rolled roofing, ended up in the hospital. He had undiagnosed uh, diabetes and at the end probably ended up with a 30 to $40,000 two week stay in the hospital. But I'm, I'm just curious about your experience within your community uh, how many people who are newly immigrant take those jobs that basically will go unfilled if there is nobody else to do them? And what are the health consequences of taking those jobs? Andrea? Yeah, I don't have the exact statistics. I'm sure uh, Dr. Tays uh, knows a little bit more about this, but uh, I do know that, uh, for example, uh, the dairy community, 90% of the people who do uh, that hard work of uh, milking cows and working in the farms, waking up so early, are immigrants. And so they do uh, they do a lot of the hard works and they are contributing so much to Wisconsin and, and to the United States in general. Yeah, unlike that, the migrant workers that are no migrant anymore that stay here in Wisconsin picking up our vegetables at like four in the morning all the way to nine or ten at night and that have skin conditions because of being out in the environment and that many times do not get any health care for that. Uh, right now, obviously, we have a lot of people that was infected uh, with COVID because they needed to go out and work because they were frontline uh, workers. We saw the meatpacking uh, factories, right? And we saw the outbreaks and we realized how uh, they didn't really give them the sanitary conditions to be able to provide for us uh, and then they had to close those uh, factories. And again, for, for the media, sometimes it was, again, these bad immigrants, they come here, they don't follow the rules and they infect everyone when in fact, they wanted to do the right thing, but they were not given the resources that they needed to have to be able to protect themselves and their families. So I'm going back to the previously submitted questions and one just deals with, uh, what do you think is the biggest health crisis right now on the uh, for individuals on the US Mexico border? Oh my goodness. Where to start? <laughs> Where to start? Uh, it's a big question because there are so many things that you heard it before, uh, the mental health what a resilience. I mean, when you see the documentaries about how people has to walk all the way from, you know, South America, all the way up here, and I can imagine what they go through. And then now with COVID being all, uh, basically living all together, um, the images that we have been seeing about the uh, Haiti community, basically uh, thousands of them living under a bridge uh, without uh, good sanitary conditions, without testing for COVID, without medical care. Uh, they were delivering babies uh, right there. And um, I just saw a, a, a program this weekend where they were interviewing the uh, San Antonio uh, mayor and the Laredo's mayor, and they were saying how uh, immigration just basically gets people in a bus they do not do COVID testing. They transport them from one place to another. Um, and then they just dump them basically in, in another place. And they don't know if they are infected and they can infect other communities. They are not giving them resources to do testing, to do vaccination, to have the adequate sanitary conditions. We have seen the pictures of kids being in cages basically at the border. How many abandoned kids that we have at the border that they cannot find the parents because they did not document appropriately who was with who. It is really a disgrace for this country to see what has been happening with immigrants. And, and, and the thing is that sometimes we don't talk about that, right? Uh, it's just there and they are immigrants and, you know, who, 
who cares for them, let them be. And then we focus in other programs that are over other problems that are important. Obviously, it's important, every problem. But when we don't put that in the spotlight, again, as I mentioned before, in the news every night, uh, then the community at large does not see it as a problem, and then they don't advocate to do something about it. Yeah, and I, I would just add that a lot of people um, have this misconception that people who are um, at the border, they just want to do it because, like, they just want to become uh, come to the United States uh, without legal authorization. But the, the truth is that a lot of these people meet the definition of refugees or asylum seekers. A lot of these people are seeking asylum. Uh, they're, they're just so desperate that they have to be at the border, but they would meet uh, the the criteria of refugees. So they are escaping persecution, violence, or they're in fear of their life. And it's a tremendous uh, difficult decision to leave like your family behind, your kids behind, or let your kids come by themselves. It's it's such a uh, hard situation that I, I don't know that a lot of people realize how hard it is to go through that process. And both of you have alluded to the both the current trauma uh, experienced with uh, the migration process, the trauma you know experienced uh, at their communities of origin, the trauma associated with the the, the process of moving, the trauma <laughs> received. Are there mental health services available in a cultural and language consistent, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Are, are, are these culturally and linguistically available for uh, the, these patients who really need services? Extremely limited. The resources are very, very limited. Again, the resources are being allocated uh, for other needs in the community and is uh, sometimes it's almost as if we are transparent, like we don't exist, right? The problems are not there. Uh, don't even ask because if you ask, you're going to have to do something about it. So um, here in the county, again, we have been able to create some safety nets for these things, but we cannot do it alone. We need the county to provide more resources, uh, more financial resources. We need to have uh, more people that are trained to work with the population. Again, we cannot assume that we're going to have people from our own community that are going to be able to provide for all of us. But if we train other uh, professionals uh, appropriately, um, uh, maybe even the language, right, if it's possible. Um, but if not, um, at least on some of the characteristics of the population and the trauma history that the population can have. Um, but we are definitely very behind. If we are behind on the physical part, the mental health services, uh, we are even worse. So, you guys have been doing a wonderful job. I'm going to finish up with one question that came in previously. Uh, and it really details with what we can be doing and what we can learn. And so what are some of the best practices or clinical pearls that you would recommend to medical students? And I'm going to add in uh, those of us who are much older than the medical students and been around a while who want to provide better care for our immigrant populations. and are there any resources or learning materials that you would recommend for those wanting to learn more about immigration health? Andrea? Um, so I can talk about the resources that I usually look up into. Um, so the CDC has a wonderful um, section for refugee and immigrants. Um, the American Academy of Pediatric also has a, a bulletin on um, basically what uh, labs and screenings we need to be doing for children, not only refugee children, but um, immigrant children in general. Um, they're, uh, again, CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics, I, I think they're the two um, of the ones that I find the most robust and the most helpful. And I'm going to speak from the heart as I usually do. 
I have mentioned this before, open your mind and open your heart. And when I have done some of those trainings, um, there is one thing that we always say, treat others, others the way you would like to be treated. That does not apply for immigrants because remember that you're from a different cultural background. So don't try to imply that your values are the same on everybody else. So ask questions and say, how do you like to deal with this? What are your beliefs about this or that? With an open mind and an open heart, you can win anybody's uh, trust when they see that you genuinely care, when you don't laugh at them when they mention that uh, they talk to their ancestors right? That is, is, is common with many cultures. And when you don't start questioning, oh, do, are they hallucinating or do they have a schizophrenia because you cannot talk to a dead person? And you don't ask more questions and ask, uh, what do you mean on that? And then we can share and say, it is our tradition that our ancestors will stay with us to protect us, to when we have a problem, we can talk to them and they will listen to us. And then you, you enrich Reach, right oh so next time you see somebody and you ask and i have another patient that said this are you doing this too oh yeah and then they go oh they know that we do those things right so i will say this applied to any patient obviously but this applied more to immigrant patients that might come from a different uh, background definitely they come from a different background that you come don't ask questions that you don't need to ask if you are going to ask what is your immigration status because you are going to help them with a program with uh, providing certain services ask the question if you just want to ask because you are curious that's not a good thing to ask if you are going to ask genuinely how was your trip your journey coming to the united states because you are going to use it to provide better care for them then ask but it's how you ask and why you ask that it's important to ask these questions. And very importantly, what do you document in a medical record that could hurt some of the immigrants, right? So a term that is used very commonly is, oh, they are undocumented and therefore they cannot have insurance. Why do you need to say that? If you just say they are uninsurable, and a person can be uninsurable for many reasons, but now you are not putting them at risk. You are just saying this person is uninsurable and we need to find other resources for them. But why do we keep on documenting things in a chart that do not have any assistance or providing the care that we do uh, to patients? So please very, very, be very, very aware of what you document and how you document. And could you repeat your uh, comment on the heart? Open your mind and open your heart. Ask questions that really are because you care. I, I have not met any human being that when you talk to them from your heart, that they will not respond with uh, respect and love to you too. And my patients, every day when they live and they serve bendiciones, blessings, right there, you know, it's, it's all I need to keep on going. I think we will let uh, you have the final word here. I would like to really greatly thank uh, Dr. Tiaz Huron. Uh, Dr. Suarez, for your input, your personal experience and views here. I'd like to thank our audience uh, for uh, your attention, uh, your participation, your interaction. Uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, we appreciate the efforts of Tracy Gatos and Robin Perrin uh, and the communication staff and also the uh, School of Medicine Public Health here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for helping to support this type of uh, programming and this type of getting the word out. So thank you so much. And with that, I wish everybody a wonderful and beautiful evening. Take care now. Adios. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Ciao.